Let's talk about Elon Musk, who's also clearly going through some things where he is mainlining these red pills and going deeper and deeper. And, and it does not appear able to stop himself. You know, he's not the only person of his prominence to be as crazy and as public about it as he is. You know, he has company in this. And uh, the most important example is Donald Trump. Donald Trump, the former president of the United States and leading Republican candidate for president, is still on trial in four different venues in Florida, in Georgia, in New York and in Washington, D.C. And the wheels of justice continue to grind exceedingly slowly. In fact, this was kind of a lull, but there were developments. And of course, uh, that's why we have a weekly podcast devoted to Trump trials. And we are joined every week by my good friend, Ben Wittes, who is the editor-in-chief of Lawfare. How are you, Ben? I'm great, uh, stuffed with Thanksgiving food and uh, um, just uh, chilling in the, in the lull. Okay, so I, I was, uh, right before we started, I said, hey, let's not talk about Henry Kissinger because I am being royally ratioed on what used to be known as Twitter for an ill-considered tweet I had about uh, Kissinger. But then what you, you pointed out- it was it was just an ill considered tweet. I just said, really, um, reading somebody else's uh, um, headline about the death. But you apparently ha- are writing an absolutely epic piece on Henry Kissinger for your dog shirt daily, and it hasn't been published yet. But could you just share that with with us a little bit? Yeah, I mean, your my, your, the, your analysis of of Henry Kissinger. So I the, started the greatest Secretary it. of State in American history, the dominant world changing statesman of our time, or the war criminal, yeah. depending on your perspective. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the lead will be Henry Kissinger was an overrated, desiccated gas bag who achieved fame by being proudly amoral in a world in which he had be, it had become normal to purport to stand for something. In this proud amorality, he may have sometimes advanced and sometimes detracted from the U.S. national interest, but he always advanced his own interests and reputation. His foes and friends have in common the tendency to wildly overstate his influence and importance Henry Kissinger was no Henry Kissinger. That's my oh, lead. Bravo. The, sto- the piece may oh. not be much more than that. Oh. I haven't decided if okay. I actually, that may be the piece, but, you know, I think the-, the I, I, I think it lets him, us know how you feel about Henry Kissinger. Yeah, the thing about I, I him is guess. like my, my whole life, people have been talking about this guy as a, either depending, you know, as some sort of, you know, prophet or- or war criminal, you know, the evidence that he's a war criminal is that he was a staffer for Richard Nixon uh, uh, when the Knicks, you know, imagine like we called Jake Sullivan, uh, mm-hmm. a, like, you know, we ascribed some sort of mystical powers to Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor, really? Um uh, it's it's all very uh, it's all very silly, but so is the uh, the the glorification of him as some kind of you know Svengali. It's all yeah. stupid stuff. It's just we, you need a background figure, preferably a self important Jew, to be the <laughs> guy who pulls all the strings. And Henry Kissinger, he had that German accent, and that made all the difference. Um, and so, you know, we all we tr- attribute lots of shit to him that really should be about Richard Nixon. Yeah. It's also a, a sign of how what a different world it was that there was all this buzz about Henry Kissinger being the playboy of the White House. You know, a guy who dated Jill St. John. And we were so bored back then that th- this was this was an object of real fascination. This was before we had, you know, actual Instagram influencers. We actually wondered about is power really the great aphrodisiac? As Henry Kissinger, I, I will implied. say that when he was over ninety, uh, according to one of my associate editors, he hit on her when she was sixteen. So, um, uh, you know, he's he. There was some truth to the uh, really? the that that side of him. 
Okay, so uh, if you want to read the rest of uh, Ben's uh, analysis, Dog Shirt Daily. Okay, I, I know we're going to get into the trials, but there's two things I have to bounce off you. Um, my two my two favorite uh, stories of the day, Elon Musk and Kevin McCarthy. Um, I'm sure you've read this story in the Washington Post. McCarthy is privately recounting a terse phone call with Donald Trump after his ouster. Now, just to review, remember, um, it was Kevin McCarthy who went down to, you know, after January 6th, went down to Mar-a-Lago, you know, brought some chicken soup to feed the depressed, um, uh, apparently emaciated uh, Donald Trump because he was so depressed. So, um, and, and then, and that Fed picture, him by hand like a I little think so. baby bird. Well, and of course, you know, that picture of the two of them together, you could argue that was, that was a real pivot point. Um, the beginning of the, the, you know, the rehabilitation of Donald Trump. So Kevin, Mike Kevin was there for Donald Trump when he most needed him. When Kevin McCarthy needed Donald Trump uh, to avoid being kicked out as speaker, Donald Trump was completely invisible, never showed up. What a shock. The loyalty only went one way. OK, so here's the story in The Washington Post this morning. Apparently, McCarthy calls up Donald Trump to basically say, WTF. OK, you know what? We're not going to get through this show without getting the explicit rating, OK? So oh, we've already got it. No, no, no we're we're going to be it, it's there's, there's there's no way to actually do today's show without doing it. I did. I, this is not gratuitous. When we talk about the Elon Musk, we Elon Musk telling all the advertisers to go f- themselves. I have to say he said go. F- yeah, so, OK, because you're right. OK, so during a phone call with McCarthy weeks after his historic October 3rd removal as House Speaker, Trump detailed the reasons he had declined to ask Representative Matt Gates and other hard right lawmakers to back off their campaign to uh, oust McCarthy from uh, leadership. According to people familiar with the exchange who, like others, spoke in condition of anonymity to disclose a private conversation. This is good. During the call, Trump lambasted McCarthy for not expunging his two impeachments and his refusal to endorse him in the 2024 presidential campaign, according to people familiar with the conversation, f- you, McCarthy claimed to have then told Trump when he rehashed the call later to other people in two separate conversations, according to the people. So we have McCarthy's version. McCarthy's going around saying that he told Trump, f- you. Now, um, a spokesman for McCarthy said that he did not swear at the former president and they have a good relationship, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so this is interesting. They, you know, Kevin McCarthy thrown under the bus talking with Donald Trump. Donald Trump says, yeah, Kevin, I didn't lift a finger for you because you didn't expunge my two impeachments. It just shows you, you know, what's going on in his mind. This is a man who has called for terminating the Constitution, who apparently at one point actually believed he could be reinstated as president and throws Kevin McCarthy under the bus because they don't actually expunge his impeachments, which... You correct me, Ben, but that's not a thing, right? Expungement? Uh, You know, one house cannot undo the actions of a prior house. Um, It's not like, you know, if there's a law, you can repeal the law. But an impeachment is a thing that the House of Representatives did. You cannot undo it any more than if I say, you know, oh, say, Charlie, go fuck yourself if I mm-hmm. were Elon Musk. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I can't unsay that. Yeah. I can apologize for mm-hmm. saying it. I can say, boy, the current Ben Wittes wishes that the past Ben Wittes hadn't said that. But it's a little bit like, you know, it's like an impeachment's like a stabbing. It, <sighs> it, once it's done, you can't like unstab somebody. That's better. I was going to say like unringing a bell, but unstabbing somebody is actually even even better. So um, this is what I, I mean, you yeah. know, it's just one of those things. But like Donald Trump doesn't live in the world in which we are bound by legal realities. Like, can you re- can you reinstate a president? Um, can you unimpeach somebody? Can you um, uh, uh, I, I don't mean there, there's these things that he believes should happen um, because happen. and and he just doesn't doesn't accept the reality that they're not structurally legally or sometimes by the way you know physically possible he doesn't it's almost believe, like he's delusional it's almost he like he is detached can, from reality i you know that you can do things with hurricanes right if you draw oh. on a, a, a sharpie on a map then they'll go a different direction 
Yeah, apparently. Okay, so let's talk about Elon Musk, who's also clearly going through some things. I mean, Elon Poor Musk Elon. has had, I mean, I, I actually, been, I, I have to say I have this morbid fascination with watching the world's richest man, who also is one of the most powerful men in the world, who has all these government contracts. I mean, he's not just a, he's not a Kardashian. I mean, this guy's got some real clout. And his decompensation in real time, sort of the unscheduled disassembly of of Twitter, is just, is really remarkable. So I think everybody knows the background. But 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 yes, what happened yesterday? And I'm not going to play the the audio of it. He's he's on this this New York Times um, format, you know, forum, and he's being asked about various anti-Semitic comments he made, which he said he regretted. Blah 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 blah. He's been pushing conspiracy theories. He did that non-apology apology tour to, to Israel, and then at one point. They're talking about the you know, major advertisers of Twitter, who are or whatever it's called now, uh, who are leaving. And Elon Musk says, "Well, I hope th- I hope they they go because f- them. Go f- yourself." He tells the advertisers, "Go f- yourself." And then a few minutes later, he says, "The and, and yes, they're going to kill Twitter. You know, they they are going to uh, you know kill Twitter, uh, and I'm going to blame them for all of this." So, I you know. What do you make of this? I mean, here is a guy who has, and you have your own history with 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 Twitter. You know, this real man of genius who launches rockets and has the battery powered cars, and there's something psychologically going on with him playing out in real time, where he is mainlining these red pills and going deeper and deeper, and and it does not appear able to stop himself. So, the, I, I'm tempted to make jokes here because Mm -hmm. you know why not it's a rich comedic terrain it is and um and i also as you mentioned have my own personal history with this he seems to have banned me from twitter at the request of the russian embassy although i have no reason to think that he did that personally but his policies uh um uh uh caused me to be banned from twitter yeah um, because free speech, am I right? I mean, there's all, all, all about free speech, um, yeah, yeah. And so, look, I mean, my um, – it is very weird to watch somebody uh, of that, uh, I don't know, stature, but yeah. importance. He's, he's undeniably important controlling both Twitter and Starlink. And his role in Tesla, he made a real contribution – Starlink remains crucially important to the Ukrainian war effort. Uh, don't underestimate the, the importance of, of this uh, uh, entity. Um, and he is evidently nuts um, in a way that is, uh, uh, you know, not content to be private about it the way other megalomaniacal billionaires like Howard Hughes or, uh, 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 you know, I'm sure others were, were quite crazy. Um, he was, he is, um, uh, he's insistent on doing it in public, mostly on Twitter, but occasionally, and, uh, you know, I would, uh, wonder what substances were involved in yesterday's uh, events, but um, uh, yeah. he mostly it is a question of of saying erratic things, and you know some of them, some of them quite viciously anti-Semitic and uh, red pilling in other respects. Um, some of them, but yesterday's was. Uh, live, and there is something always dramatic about watching somebody do that live. I will say that you know he has company in this, and uh, the most important example is Donald Trump. That you know he's not the only person of his prominence to be as crazy and as public about it as he is. Kanye. Um, you know, there's this whole sequence of people who have done these kind of public yeah. uh, decompensation things. Um, and um, uh, it does seem like a new feature of our culture. I don't know what to make of it. And um, and 
I don't know. I mean, all jokes aside, he clearly needs help, and I hope he gets some. Yeah, no, I mean, there is there. Is, yeah, all jokes aside, the the sort of the spread of crazy is is disturbing. I'm really interested with what Brian Class is now calling the banality of crazy. That when it comes to people like Donald Trump, for example, um, we've gotten so used to all the crazy things he says that when he calls for the the termination of the Constitution or the uh, you know the death penalty for for General Mark Milley, people kind of just shrug their shoulders and it doesn't get covered. And you know, uh, class brought it up again yesterday because uh, Tr- Trump is out now on social Truth Social going after, and I'm a contributor to MSNBC. This but that really is neither here nor there. But basically, say, you know, threatening to use the power of the government to go after Comcast, NBC, MSNBC, because they are critical of, of him. The pivot on the right from being we are the champions of free speech to damn right. Let's use the federal government as a hammer to go after NBC. And because of the because the crazy has become because of the banality of crazy. It's probably not even going to make the front page of most newspapers in America, as if front pages mattered anymore. What do you think? Yeah, I think that's right. And I think the phrase, the banality of crazy, is interesting. Um, and, uh, of course, a, a, a allusion to Hannah Arant's The Banality of Evil. Um, the banality, The interesting thing about the banality of crazy, though, unlike the banality of evil, is that we seem to love to watch it. And, um, they, you know, her, Arant's point about Eichmann, right or wrong, is that he was actually a boring and altogether uninteresting individual, like, l- leave aside the fact that he was uh, uh, the executor in a literal sense of a lot of people's deaths. Yeah. Um, he wasn't an interesting person, but the banality of crazy is it's really fun to watch. And 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 we as a society do seem to love it. We, we, we do. Um, and in, in my newsletter today in Morning Shots, I actually reminded people that that you know, people keep you know comparing Donald Trump to Mussolini as if somehow that's disqualifying. But I want to remind people that it was a time when Americans really loved the you know, Il Duce. They loved his style. They loved his showmanship. He was one of the first celebrity political figures of the 20th century. Um, Big in Hollywood, the media gushed over him. And so the one thing that Donald Trump understands is never be boring, never be banal, never be banal, um, and always, you know, have that spotlight on me. And so I, I actually don't think that the that the mango Mussolini actually is particularly bothered by being compared with the original. No. And in fact, they have other things in common too, um, which is, um, uh, you know, a, um, uh, uh, a sense that if people aren't talking about you, Mussolini read, spent hours a day reading the newspaper uh, for references to himself. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, that's the equivalent in this era of what Trump does, which is spending hours a day watching Fox News, right? And watching, you know, Newsmax to see how he's being talked about. There's a there's a, a real egomaniacal similarity between the two. Oh yeah, so let's talk about the Trump trials. Um, this is, there's there's been th- things going on. Um, none of them have been particularly prominent this particular week, but it has been grinding on. We are still waiting for um, the appeals court to come back on the question of a gag order on the former uh, president. Most observers that I've read or listened to think that the appeals court will uphold um, the at least um, portions of the gag order. Uh, but give me your thoughts about uh, give me your thoughts about that, because it's not theoretical that Donald Trump's words have consequences. And obviously, no, not- the judges understand this. Correct. So the um, question is, so- what will they do about it? Yeah, so there are, we're waiting on a number of things at this point, and there's a, a little bit of a judicial bottleneck um, uh, in terms of 
things that have been argued and fully briefed that we are waiting to happen. This is now in the DC case. Mm -hmm. Um, So the first is, as you say, the uh, gag order. Um, This was argued uh, just before Thanksgiving uh, in the DC circuit before a uh, panel of uh, that I think can be reasonably described as uh, pretty friendly to Judge Chutkin's mm-hmm. ruling. Yeah. Um, they, uh, uh, the argument, by the way, which is for those who enjoy listening to good or- oral arguments, it's a, it's an excellent performance. Very impressive. By, it's yeah. very, very impressive. Three seriously impre- engaged mm-hmm. judges uh, who are. Uh, who are really exploring in a serious way what the judge can and can't do here. Um, and um, uh, it's a ve- it's a two hour argument. It's available. Uh, uh, you can listen to it on the Lawfare No Bull feed, as well as you can find it on the DC Circuit's uh, uh, website, YouTube page. Um, Lawfare No Bull, by the way, mm. is a feed that we have that does sort of primary source audio of this type. A lot of Excellent. Fulton County hearings, a lot of D.C. Circuit hearings. So we're waiting on that. They will, I believe, uphold the bulk of what Judge Chutkin did. And that will put that um, order back into effect um, currently, Trump is not subject to a gag order mm-hmm. of any kind in the D.C. Uh, case. Uh, the other big things we are waiting for, um, the most important is a ruling from Judge Chutkin herself on the question of whether to dismiss the case for reasons of executive immunity. Mm-hmm. And the reason this is a critical question is not that she is likely to grant this yeah. ruling, which I think she is not, um, but because this ruling would be subject to immediate appeal. Mm-hmm. And that appeal could, not certainly would, but right. could delay the trial. Um, and that could go all the way up to the Supreme court. It could go all the way up to the Supreme court, either the DC circuit, either judge Chuck and herself or the DC circuit or the Supreme court could theoretically slap a stay on the proceedings. That's the question. While it hears this question. Um, and that could interfere with the March 5th trial deadline. I think realistically, that's the only thing that could really mess up the March 5th trial deadline, it's but a big uh, one. it's a big one. Yeah. And so we are waiting for that ruling so we can start that, uh, that interlocutory appeal and see whether anyone's going to slap a stay on the proceedings. Um, this is, I think, the biggest question that's open as to the uh, March 5th date. And uh, if you're you know, if you're hung up, as I am, on the question of whether Donald Trump is likely to go to trial in any case that will be completed before the election, this is a critical, critical question. And the March 5th trial deadline uh, or date that Judge Chutkin has set is the most likely case to actually go to okay. trial and be finished. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about this uh, kabuki dance going on with 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 trial dates. Um, the you know between I mean because you you have all of these different uh, you know jurisdictions. You have Judge Eileen Cannon who appears to be just dragging her feet, you know as you know moving as slowly as possible. You have the Fulton County case. Obviously, they're looking to see whether she's going to schedule anything. So how how does that play out? How does it get resolved? The first question as to how it gets resolved relates to the question of whether the March 5th trial deadline is real. Mm-hmm. Um, so if that date actually happens, uh, no, nobody can or will schedule a trial that will interfere with that. So the second, but if it lapses... Um, then everything gets pushed back potentially because we do seem to be operating in a DC goes first environment. Mm -hmm. 
So the second question is, what is Judge Cannon going to do? Yeah. And the answer, she currently has a May 25th trial deadline mm -hmm. uh, date scheduled. Everybody seems to believe that trial date is going to slip. And that has something a lot to do with Judge Cannon's uh, less than above board behavior in terms of scheduling stuff. Um, she, But we're not going to know that until early March because she has a status conference at which, for scheduling purposes, scheduled for March 1st. So everybody's kind of operating with the assumption that on March 1st, we're going to learn that that May 25th trial deadline for trial date for the South Florida case is going to get pushed back. Now, the question is, how far back is it going to get pushed? And, um, you know, you could imagine that being kind of a month or two. You could also imagine if she really wants to help Trump uh, push it back past the election. Yeah. Uh, the third date relevant is the Fulton County, Georgia mm -hmm. trial date. Fonnie Willis, the DA in, in that case, has asked for an August trial date. Uh, mm -hmm. This is uh, great for... Uh, uh, for great and terrible for foes of Donald Trump, great in the sense that it terrible in the sense that it almost certainly would mean that a trial would not be wrapped up by the end of the by the right. time of the election, but great in the sense that you would have an ongoing trial of Donald Trump for having overthrown tried to overthrow the last election while you know, in the months between the Republican convention and the election. So you'd have like, you know, daily trial news. Would he have to be attending that trial? How, how does, you know, so it would really throw a wrench into the campaign. I don't really understand how that would work logistically. Um, uh, you know, jokes aside, uh, Judge McAfee, uh, who is the the very impressive young judge who's supervising this case, um, is going to have to think very hard about, you know, how you run a trial. If he's inclined to grant that trial date, he, it may also push until after the election as a result. Yeah. So, and then you have the wild card, which is the New York Stormy Daniels hush money payments yeah. case, who seems to be inclined to let other yeah. trials go first. But if everything else slips, you know, you could have a New York trial in there too. So it's, it's a, it's a game of musical chairs with trial dates. And I think the first event we're going to be looking for to, again, to see whether who's going to go when, when the music stops is when judge Chutkin issues this ruling uh, and then we see whether either the D.C. Circuit or the Supreme Court stays the proceedings while they think about this question. So we're going to come back to Georgia in in just a moment. We're talking with your um, your colleague, Anna Bauer, about something that uh, she's been writing about there. But just a, a note on the on the documents case uh, down in Florida. ABC reported yesterday that one of Donald Trump's current employees told Jack Smith's team that within days of the Department of Justice issuing a subpoena for all the classified documents at Mar-a-Lago, she, quote, very clearly, unquote, warned Trump that if he failed to comply, but then swore that he did, it's going to be a crime. Jennifer Little, the attorney, told investigators that Trump absolutely understood that, you know, her warning that if you do this, it will be a crime if you still keep these documents. I mean, so obviously that revelation might explain how uh, Smith came to accuse Trump of knowingly violating the law that she has somebody. Um, so uh, she reportedly warned him, you have to comply uh, as ABC laid out. But the indictment filed against Trump in Florida alleges that he did not comply and failed to turn over all documents in his possession, allegedly opting to obstruct Justice Department efforts. In particular, according to the indictment, Trump tried to conceal his continued retention of classified documents and caused a false certification to be submitted to the FBI, claiming that all classified documents had been returned. This just is a sort of a reminder of how strong this case is. And 
you know, I don't know that we'll Look, ever hear about it in the court with Eileen Cannon presiding, but but Jack Smith has a damn solid case down there. Yeah, Judge Cannon can delay this case. Yeah. She can create highly disadvantageous conditions in which the government will try it. She can make uh, any of a number of uh, adverse rulings to the government restricting the introduction of all kinds of evidence. But at the end of the day, this is a barn burner of a case. And it, it is, is. A, a barn burner of a case in an environment in which uh, the law is extraordinarily friendly to the government. Uh, and by the way, you know, maybe in some ways too friendly, although this would case would not be an example of that. But you know, if you have classified information right. and you are told to return it and you are aware that you have classified information and you don't return it, you are guilty of a felony. Yeah. And it's not there. You don't have to have all kinds of bad intent to have done terrible things or blah, blah, blah. But, you know, this is a and by the way, if if you have a subpoena for documents and you don't yield them up, that is obstruction of justice. And, you know, and so this is just a case in which the, the volume of evidence mm -hmm. is really, really big. And the and the clarity the, of the evidence, the clarity, there, there of they the are. Evidence, they're the documents. And, you either have them, or you don't and, have them, you know, and it ranges from, you know, the testimony of your lawyers to video evidence of the way the document boxes are being handled to, I mean, this is not going to be when this case is presented eventually, it is not going to be, you know, an ambiguous situation. And that is why it is. And, and by the way, you know, the DC case, you have all these questions yeah. about, you know, what, prerogatives the right. president has, what immunities the president has, whether, you know, there are free speech aspects. Sure. There, there, there's some complicating mm -hmm. factors in D.C., although I still think it's a very strong case. Mm -hmm. There's none of that here. No. No. So when this case goes to trial, and that's why, by the way, it's super important for tr to Trump to push this case off, because exactly. it's a bad Bad. This is why he must him. win that election in his mind. He has Correct. to be the president because for Donald Trump, it's either the Oval Office or a felony conviction. So, um, so I want to ask you about something you have planned, but let's, let's switch gears for a moment because I want to talk about what's happening down in Georgia right now. Look, look, as a reminder, the Fulton County indictment includes this astonishing allegation that the president's legal team aided by local officials and party loyalists, plotted to unlawfully copy and disseminate the state's voting machine software in rural Coffee County, Georgia. It's just a strange sort of side story. You know, Coffee County was part of the plot, of course, to overturn the 2020 election results. Four of the 19 defendants who were charged in, I'm sorry, four of the 19 defendants were charged in connection with this Coffee County plot, and two of them have pleaded guilty already, Sidney Powell and this Atlanta uh, bail bondsman named Scott Hall, um, to, uh, to have uh, pleaded not guilty. So this is separate from the Fulton County prosecution. Uh, and, and the Georgia Bureau of Investigation recently released the results of its 13-month investigation. And we're joined now by Anna Bauer, um, a legal fellow and courts correspondent at Lawfare, who actually read this comprehensive report. And I have to say, and, uh, you know, what's it? Uh, first of all, um, thanks for joining us on the on the podcast on Trump trials today. Appreciate that. Uh, but let, let's talk about this. This 392 page investigative report by the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. I mean, that sounds pretty juicy. And then I read your account in Lawfare. What did you find? Right. So it does sound pretty juicy. And I should say thanks for having me today, Charlie, sure. uh, to talk about this, because I think it is important. Uh, so just to make sure that folks are clear, this is a separate investigation right. that took place in parallel with the Fulton County District Attorney's Office. Uh, so, it, you know, it, it's something that the Fulton County District Attorney uh, has now brought charges against. 
But it, this is something that was going on for 13 months, uh, you know, separate from that investigation. Mm -hmm. And the GBI is kind of like the equi state level equivalent of the FBI. Right. So they have this statewide Plus jurisdiction. Right. They're they're not as, uh, you know, limited as the Fulton County District Attorney would be in terms of jurisdiction and resources. So you would expect that they would really fully, thoroughly and completely investigate what is a very serious yeah. allegation in the Fulton County indictment that the president, the then president's legal team conspired with local officials and allies to breach Georgia's voting systems and distribute copies of that software. Uh, and what I found, however, is that, in fact, what the GBI's investigation uh, consisted of was basically just replicating uh, things that had already been revealed in civil litigation through the January 6th committee. Uh, they interviewed about 15 witnesses over the course of this 13 month investigation. Most of those interviews took place in less than an hour. Uh, they did not interview many key witnesses and they omitted some key details that that really could have connected some of the dots between you know, how did these local rural people in South Georgia get connected with the then president's legal team? So what what you're suggesting here uh, in, in some detail is that the, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, despite this massive investigative report, really didn't do much of an investigation as as the word is generally understood. Right. I mean, it's it's, it's not like they kind of mailed it in. Right. It was it was I think I call it a badly inadequate investigation in the piece. Uh, you know, I, again, this is a very serious allegation. Uh, it, it, there is an alleged conspiracy in the Fulton County indictment. And again, the Fulton County District Attorney's uh, case already involves 19 people in that alleged mm -hmm. RICO conspiracy. However, there are 30 unindicted co-conspirators uh, some of those people, their identities, you know, have we've been able to match them up to to who they are based on public information. Uh, and some of those individuals of those 30 unindicted co-conspirators are people who the district attorney alleges, you know, helped coordinate or plan this breach in Coffee County. Or they are people who, uh, you know, distributed or, or, or sought access to the data that was copied. Um, and again, I just want to make sure that folks are clear that, you know, th this what happened in Coffee County, a, a lot of election security experts say that it could have some potential risk going forward into 2024 uh, because the state of Georgia still uses that same software that they copied. So it wasn't just, you know, copying ballots or co copying voter data. It was copying software, which is the very software that we use in Georgia and in some other states. And so, you know, there's this risk that the distribution could allow people to uh, manipulate the data so that it looks legitimate. But in fact, it's, you know, kind of selectively presented as as what happened in Antrim County, Michigan during the 2020 election uh, with that Antrim County report, if people remember that. It's also the case that this data could be you know, looked at to search for vulnerabilities that could be exploited through malware and that kind of thing. So it, it's something that is is has serious consequences. It's a serious alleged crime in the Fulton County indictment. Uh, however, what the GBI did not do is kind of answer the question of when did this plan arise? Uh, who came up with it? Who was involved in the coordination? They missed some key details like that. Uh, December 18th, 2020 White House meeting. If yes. folks remember, that's that unhinged famous meeting in which uh, Sidney Powell so you're, you're, and Mike You're connecting Sen these dots. I mean, Anna, yeah. what's really mm -hmm. helpful about this is that I, we've heard these sort of bits and pieces around here. And what you're doing is saying, look, all of these actually related because actually until I read your piece, I hadn't really connected that December 18th, 2020 meeting in the White House where they talked about seizing voting machines and Rudy Giuliani talking about gaining voluntary access to machines in Georgia. And then he goes on on Steve Bannon's podcast the next day to talk about this big project down in Georgia going behind Brian Kemp's back. And as you point out, this is not even included in this this Georgia Bureau of Investigation report into what happened. I mean, 
This actually, in some ways, it's easy to think of it as a sideshow, but really it was part of the overall conspiracy. And it traces all the way back up to these meetings in the White House. Right. And it's not just, you know, that they Rudy Giuliani discussed voluntary access in that meeting and then the next day, you know, goes on Steve Bannon's podcast. Uh, what in that, you know, piece that I wrote and in, in reporting that piece, I was able to find out that Kathy Latham had stayed from December 16th to around December. Well, she's 18th one of the defendants here. Yeah, she's right. yeah. So I yeah. should explain. I, I'm sorry. Yeah. I get yeah. a little bit too lost yeah. in the details. Yeah. But Kathy Latham is the former Coffee County GOP chairperson who uh, is one of the people who is on video escorting this forensics team who copied all of the data in Coffee County in January 2021. She is alleged to have helped, you know, plan and coordinate the the breach that occurred. But we were able to find out through through our reporting, and it's in this piece, that Kathy Latham was at the Willard Hotel around the time that, you know, the Trump campaign was looking for access to voting machines, either through executive orders that mention specifically Coffee County or through voluntary access. And she, there are social media posts in which she says that she met with Rudy Giuliani on that trip. There's also a photo that we found of Kathy Latham with Mike Flynn and Sidney Powell at the Trump Hotel, which is where they allegedly drafted these executive orders to seize voting machines that mention Coffee County. So there's all of this stuff happening around this time that that certainly is circumstantial. And I'm not coming to any conclusion about, you know, what exactly happened and what was discussed. But it all seems to be something that any reasonable investigator would look into. No, this is this is this is great stuff. People ought to uh, check out uh, Anna Bauer's piece uh, in Law Fair. Anna, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. I appreciate it. Thanks very so much. much for having me. Thank you. All right. Well, that was very very interesting. So we're back with uh, with with Ben Wittes. Uh So Ben, hey, before we don't, wrap don't up, don't ever get on the wrong side of Anna Bauer because I would never. She she will find out everything terrible about you. Every. Every election you've ever tried to overthrow, overthrow. Every time you came yeah. to D.C. thinking it was about going, you know, saying it was about going to the Bible Museum, and you were actually meeting with Rudy Giuliani Awkward. in the in you know just you know don't get on Anna Bauer's bad side. Okay, you know, point point taken. Um, also, it's always dangerous to get on your bad side, uh, Ben. Uh, your bad side, Ben. Um, because you have these various military operations that you have planned and you're doing something a little bit different this weekend. I mean, this is the word yeah, on the so, street. Yeah. So I, um, uh, my, my trusty laser projector and I, and I'm still not a hundred percent sure I'm going to be able to pull this off. Mm -hmm. We've decided Lord laser and I have decided that we need to send a message to Congress to, uh, uh, to, to, actually pass the supplemental because the situation in Ukraine is, is really quite desperate. And, um, and so we want to, want to send a message. So um, if we can pull it off, I think the national park service police are going to be okay with it, but we gotta, we gotta, yeah, but you're not allowed Saturday to project evening. on the Capitol, right? I mean, this is it. I mean, I'm you've not, been project I, for people who are, people who are catching up here, Ben and Ben, ben and his, his team, um, project like the Ukrainian flag on the Russian embassy and, and in, in this case, it's going yeah. to be, yeah, we, 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 I would never project on the United States Capitol. Okay. And in fact, the Capitol police would not allow me to do that. Mm. Um, and, um, and I, so a week ago I thought I have a great idea in I will project on the reflecting I know, I read about in that. front of the Capitol. And I that actually turned out not to work yeah, for two yeah. reasons. One is water. that I didn't know this. Water scatters light from a laser. Uh, and so these Good to know, though. laser projections yeah. actually look terrible yeah. on water. Um, I thought it would be beautiful. It wasn't. And then mm. the second reason was the Capitol Police we're, look, I don't want to criticize the Capitol Police. They're uh, on edge lately. This January yeah. 6th mm -hmm. thing. They've got, you know, unresolved bombings at the DNC and RNC, you know, from the, I'm not I love the Capitol Police not messing with them. Mm -hmm. I did not know that they consider uh uh, projecting on the water of the reflecting pool, the same as projecting on the Capitol. So we had a very polite, interesting conversation. 
Um, and uh, they asked me not to do it, and I didn't do it. So then I was looking for a place that is outside of Capitol Police yeah. jurisdiction and there where you can clearly project not on the Capitol, but in a fashion that the uh, is, that really has the Capitol in your sights when you take pictures okay. of it. And I found it, and it is the lawn of the mall at the seventh, where Seventh Street crosses the mall. There is a big patch of lawn with the Capitol in the background. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm going to test it tonight. Uh, uh, can I project there without bothering the U.S. Park Police? On the lawn. If, on, on down onto the lawn okay. um, from a high tripod. Mm -hmm. And if I can do that, and I'll, I'll, I'll put a picture of it if I can do it in Dog Shirt Daily tonight, okay. uh, along with the Henry Kissinger uh, uh, okay. uh, uh, obit. Um, and um, I will see whether await the results of this test. Yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna do an experiment tonight, and if I can, I'm gonna let the local Ukrainian community know that I'll be doing it uh, properly on Saturday evening, uh, and uh, uh, doing. You know, today I'll just do a little Ukrainian flag just to see if I can do it. But then Saturday evening, I will uh, have you know, you know, maybe more people will turn out, and I'll uh, will 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 do it properly with an appropriate message to Congress uh, and to uh, the Speaker of the House um, uh, that it's you know important not to forget about Ukraine in all of our domestic dysfunction. You are a great American, Mr. Wittis, and thank you so much you for joining us again. You are a great American, Charlie Sykes. Um, <laughs> and uh, we will be back next week, and we will do this all, all over, over again. again. Thanks for joining us.